You're listening to What is Black, the parenting podcast where we address issues important to raising healthy and thriving Black children and adolescents. I'm your host, Dr. Jacqueline Duje. So thank you for joining us for another episode. Today's episode is hosted by one of What is Black's advisory board members, Nina Duje. Nina asked a few of her friends to join her on a conversation about youth activism. And throughout the conversation, you know, she'll explore the importance of youth activism, the different ways that youth can can be, be engaged in youth activism, the discussion about how parents can support youth, as well as discussing the importance of voting. My name is Nina Duje. I am a first year or a rising first year into Vanderbilt University. I will be going into education um, and I'll be moderating today's panel. I would like to introduce you to the panelists. We have um, Jack, Caleb, and Rakaya with here us with us today. Would you guys like to start with an introduction? Why don't we start with Rakaya? Hi everyone. My name is Rakaya. I'm an incoming first year to the University of Pennsylvania, hoping to major in health and societies on the pre-med track. And for my activism, I worked a lot in my high school providing platforms for a black voice. Okay, can we go to Caleb next? Yeah, hey everybody. Um, my name is Caleb. I'm an incoming freshman at Yale. I plan on double majoring in computer science and ethics, politics, and economics. Um, and most recently, in terms of the activist work that I've been doing, um, I've been working with a local organization called Chicago Votes, trying to get people registered to vote um, and help them figure out the whole vote by mail system. Um, and I've also been taking some free time to write a little bit. Cool, cool. And last but not least, Jack. Hi, everyone. I'm Jack Starabin. I'm from Olney, Maryland. Uh, raiser, rising freshman at the University of Pennsylvania, planning to major in philosophy, politics, and economics. Uh, I'm currently working on the communications team of Disability Rights Maryland, uh, which is the Maryland organization uh, working to advance the civil rights of people with disabilities. Uh, we're just working to get their message out. And I'm passionate about all forms of social justice encouraged by this summer. You all have such impressive backgrounds. Um, I know you guys have a lot to bring to the table. The first question I'd like you guys to think about is, um, do you think youth activism is a relatively new phenomenon in context of our current political climate? Is it, do you think it's widespread based on what you've experienced, the people that you interact with and work with? It's open floor. I guess I can hop in here really quickly. Um, I'd say, you know, being from Chicago, um, I've always kind of had to be plugged into uh, activist movements just because Chicago is such a vibrant um, and very progressive city. Um, and I'd say that this is definitely not anything new. Um, I know a lot of young folks that have been uh, activists since they could talk, you know. Um, this is something that's built into a lot of people's family structures. And so, um, you know, the recent events with the unfortunate murder of George Floyd have really just allowed them a platform to actually um, talk about the things they've been talking about so long on a, on a larger scale and really um, push people who haven't necessarily been listening to them um, to actually listen to them and to think about what their uh, their life perspective is when they're crafting policy. I agree with Caleb, and I feel like youth activism has always been here, and it'll always be here, but right now, it's just being publicized, and so you see people throughout the nation, throughout the world, coming together, working together to be activists for these movements, and I feel like it's very powerful getting social media and youth, combining them, it's a perfect combo. I agree. And just to add to what Caleb and Rakai have already said, uh, I live about an hour from DC. So youth activism and all other forms of activism are commonplace here. Uh, but yes, they're being publicized more uh, right now, which is what's giving the, the illusion of an explosion in urgency. But the reality is these, the crises that we're protesting have always been urgent. Uh, they're just getting publicized now. Yeah, I hear that. And I think that has a lot to do with just the movement of social media, right? Has, how has social media 
impacted the way that you guys are active. And that's like in any forms like art. I know TikTok is a new thing recently, um, especially with the quor with quarantine, how is social media kind of giving you a space or taken away from space? Yeah, I can, I can just hop in and say like, I'm in a little bit of a unique position. Um, I have kind of had like a back and forth relationship with social media. Um, sometimes I just take extended breaks from social media and don't use it at all. Um, but I think there definitely is a value. Like I see my friends, my peers using social media to, to push their message forward. And I think something that's a relatively recent development has been these like little educational like squares of Instagram posts, like 10 carousel slides where people just give you the rundown on like a complete topic. And I think that it, that is incredibly valuable, especially when you're talking about um, you know, people just realizing that the issues that we're bringing up are actually pertinent um, and people looking for ways to educate themselves. I think that's something um, that's an amazing development and that I hope um, stays prominent uh, in future years. I feel like social media has just been very helpful for my activism, um, particularly recently. So I'm the founder of the New Jersey Students of Color Conference. And basically, it's a diversity conference that gathers students of color from PWIs throughout New Jersey to meet each other and just discuss their experiences um, within their institutions. And so we started the program last year. And, you know, last year, like, we didn't really use Instagram. We mainly just, like, send out emails to everyone saying, like, hey, this is what it is. Come. Whereas this year, we started our social media platform. We have an Instagram. We have a little website. And we had so many more people come um, to NJSCC this year. And it was really incredible seeing how social media can just spread our words, like just throughout everywhere. And um, for quarantine, it's been, it's just been very different, um, not being in school and not being able to do that like in-person activism. But one thing that I've been doing was, I remember um, a few months ago, all the events occurring with George Floyd and all the protests, my school was absolutely silent about it. Absolutely silent about it. And I just could not tolerate it. You have a population of black students who are hurting and you need to speak about this. And so um, through my Instagram, I created like a email um, template so that current students at my high school could basically just copy and paste the email template and just send it to administration. And I posted this on my story on Instagram and there were over like a hundred emails that were sent to administration um, asking for them to not be silent about this issue. And so social media has been pretty incredible for my activism. Yeah, I think to add to that, there's nothing, there's no more powerful representation of the the impact of crowdsourcing information through social media than the black at accounts of colleges and private high schools, which I think is just an incredibly powerful and really uh, effective because uh, it's consolidated like reservoir of experiences and like proof of exactly what you're talking about to administrations that might be skeptical if you were just to hand these stories to them on an individual case-by-case -case basis. So real I think- quick, Real quick, Jack, could you elaborate just a little bit on the Black At Instagram account? Oh, sure. Uh, so uh, in the wake of George Floyd's death and the, the movement for racial justice that was greatly publicized and gained a great following this summer, uh, Black students and in some cases, other students of color at, at private schools, at colleges, sometimes at public schools as well, uh, started Instagram pages where they uh, just submitted, usually anonymously, their stories uh, of confrontation with racism in various forms, subtle or overt, uh, systemic or individual. Uh, and it's made the problem impossible to ignore for a lot of people who would rather look the other way. And that is entirely made possible by the ease of access of platforms like Instagram. Just to, to return to the, the flip side of the question of has Instagram taken away any space uh, from activism? I think, so, so one of the things I noticed when I think this, the trend of this summer for racial justice started was with the publicizing of Ahmaud Arbery's 
the video of Ahmaud Arbery's death, which went viral and got some criticism for going viral because some people felt this is traumatizing. Why are we forcing people to look at this over and over and over again? We should not be desensitizing. Uh, I still kind of empathize with both arguments uh, for posting or not posting. Uh, but I think it's, it, it is just to say that the ease of acts, the ease with which you could publicize information on Instagram means that sometimes people post before they think. Uh, and so it can derail the, like that way when everybody was posting black squares and hashtag using the hashtag black lives matter and then completely silenced the black lives matter hashtag. Cause it was just covered in black squares. So I think the, the, the space of Instagram can sometimes be detrimental, but overall I think it's had a good impact. Yeah. And I actually just want to add really quickly to your point, Jack. Um, I think something that's unique to Chicago with the use of social media is that, um, you know, over the past week um, we had an incident where people went downtown um, and looted stores and property um, in justified frustration over um, how, you know, the, the city's administration has been handling um, recent protest um, and has really been antagonizing young folks getting out there and being activists. And so um, a lot of people have been um, quote unquote doxxed um, by police officers. A lot of young folks, like only 18 years old, their personal information is posted online. Um, and, you know, people have the ability to completely come after these young folks uh, because they're standing up for what they believe in. And I think that that's, that's definitely a dangerous side of social media um, that has yet to be uh, completely dealt with. Continuing on like what's dangerous with social media, you get the murder of Breonna Taylor and her murderers have not been arrested yet. And you get these people who are desensitized to everything and they make her murder a meme. And this is something that you constantly see with black women, black women constantly being ridiculed over serious issues. Look at Megan Thee Stallion. She was shot and people laughed at it. Like they made a complete mockery of the whole entire situation and really took it out of context. And so while media, yes, it has its perks, people also don't use it in the correct ways and a lot of times ridicule black women. Um, going off going off of that point, Rakaya, how has mental health played into your relationship with social media and kind of keeping up with the fast paced nature of it all, but also making sure that you yourself are also healthy. Because that you you guys touched on the dangerous side of social media and that can be physical, literal, literally people are like handle, mishandling your information or personal, interpersonal, emotional. So I think first uh, in terms of keeping up uh, with the the at times overwhelming pace of social media activism so it's it's easy for me uh just speaking for myself from my from my own experience to get so swept up in the 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 fast pace of expressing outrage through social media that my message starts to get convoluted that i stop processing what it is that I'm posting that I might see an upsetting post and just like repost immediately because like because we all know the by we I mean my followers in this case all know like the sentiment behind the post we know the system that we're trying to represent we know the message we're trying to publicize so I will stop taking the moment to process what happened which is not doing the the mm -hmm. injustice justice if you see something wrong especially when it's in my opinion when it's not rooted in your own experience you owe it to whoever the experience is happening to to take a moment to try to process and empathize and pause and i think social media can kind of wash that moment away uh, because it's so fast-paced so that that can also leave me pretty mentally frazzled uh, you know feeling kind of off center uh it's not full-blown anxiety but i think that uh you know, it, it is a contributing factor to just feeling anxious in an already tense political climate and deeply troubling situation for many Americans and people around the world. 
Yeah, I would I would just say um, I've definitely had a very complicated relationship with social media over my entire high school career. Um, and I would say, like, of course, I had social media when we went into quarantine because there was absolutely nothing else to do. So, yeah, I had Instagram, Snapchat, Twitter, all of that stuff. Um, I was bored. And so I, I watched Ahmaud Arbery's video, actually. And that was that was definitely triggering and traumatizing. But um, I had kind of got used to getting triggered and traumatized by social media at certain points, um, just because I think, uh, especially on certain platforms, there's a lot of space for, um, you know, very extreme and disturbing, like, messages and images. Um, and I think you, you kind of start to get used to that. And so when George Floyd's video rolled around, I actually refused to watch it. Like, I, I couldn't bring myself to do it. Um, and that was like the inflection point for me. Like I, I deleted Instagram, I deleted Twitter, Snapchat, all of that stuff. Um, and I just, I buried my head in books. Like I, I went into a different world. You know, I read um, stuff like 1984, like you know, just random nonfiction, fiction books, all that stuff, um, just to get away from it all. And it was, it was such a necessary detox. And it actually uh, pushed me into writing, into, you know, detailing my feelings and my experiences. Um, in words, because I feel like, you know, personally, that's the best way um, for me to communicate my stances on issues. Um, and yeah, I have gotten back into social media recently, but I'm much more um, careful and cautious and intentional about the way that I use social media. I know it's a tool, but I don't use it as my one stop shop for entertainment and content. Caleb said it all. Um, <laughs> with social media, like, I just sometimes I just have to flat out delete everything. Like, I just can't take it anymore. As a black woman in America, like I've experienced so much trauma, even though like it's not directly towards me, like just seeing people who look like me put into these positions who are constantly murdered. Like, I just cannot handle that. That is just too much on me. So I just delete it. And it's, it's made me really angry, especially seeing people who are posting all these little cute facts on their Instagram stories when they're not even putting in the work. Like you're posting it, sure, okay, you read it, but like you're not really taking into account what they're actually saying and putting that into your daily routine. And so that just frustrates me. That just makes me angry. So um, I delete it. I've started writing, trying to process my feelings and trying to like figure out what is making me so upset. Like why do I have this deep pit in my heart? And honestly, um, just talking, talking with my family, talking with my friends about how they're feeling and just trying to process our emotions in this time of turmoil. I think you you bring up a good point, Rakai, about performative activism and how that plays out on social media. Um, and I was going to ask a question about that, but just real quick before we move on. How have slash are, have adults, mentors, teachers, whoever it may be, have they been supportive in your mental health journey when being an activist? Or have they not? And in what ways? I feel like in the current scene that we're in now, like I have learned who is there to support me and who has and who's just like not gonna be there for me. And so I've learned that I just have to like pick and choose the people who I surround myself, who are who are just surrounded by me. And so like, I have a few teachers from my high school who are like there for me, like constantly like sending me emails, texting me, like, how are you doing? Just checking in. And then there are some teachers who I honestly trusted in my high school experience who haven't said anything at all. And so I guess it's just been a rude awakening coming to terms with like what, with the, with what the, with how some people are just responding to the situation. But um, I feel like it's just, definitely been a learning process, like learning who is there for me, learning who's not, and just being okay with the people who are there for me and like just being all right with that. Yeah, I would say personally, I've leaned a lot on family for support. Of course, I use my teachers um, to run ideas by and like, you know, push back against their, their um, positions on things and they push back against mine. Uh, I think that's really healthy um, and it pushes me to you know, really refine my stances on things. But when it comes time for like stepping away um, and taking time to myself, like I lean on my family, the people that have been with me since day one. Um, like my mom is notorious for pulling me back from the ledge. Like I, I will push myself to the limit. And my mom is always there to be like, hey, you know, slow down, 
Um, and, and so that's something that's been really, really valuable for me. Um, just having that support system built in to let me know, like, um, maybe you should take a step back. You've going, you've been going a little bit too hard and you've had um, tunnel vision for a little bit of time. So, you know, maybe it's time to step back and just um, reassess your position. I think first and foremost for me, this past summer has really encouraged me and tested me to be a present friend, unintrusively present in this pandemic uh, and in the greater dialogue that's going on right now. I rely on family and friends to process to de-stress, of course. Uh, but let's be honest, I'm not facing the blunt of the stress because I'm not facing the blunt of the brunt of the experience uh, that's producing the protests, the activism in the first place. Uh, and I think it's for me a lot about just being just just saying what's up, just checking in. Um, yeah, and <laughs> that does not necessitate that we have to dialogue about all of the posts that are going on crazy left and right. Um, it's just about being a present and supportive friend without intruding all the time. I'm excited to welcome our new sponsor, Puzzle Huddle. Puzzle Huddle creates puzzles that feature diverse Black characters. They believe that when children play with toys that feature images that look like them, they have the opportunity to be affirmed and engage in imaginative play in a very personal way. And I believe this brand really supports the mission of What is Black to help raise healthy and thriving Black children through play and seeing themselves reflected back in the toys that they play with. These puzzles are also a great excuse to play together as a family. One of my favorite puzzles is Ballerina Love that I'm looking at right now. I was excited to unpackage it and actually put the puzzle together. It features a beautiful brown girl dancing. I'm ready to frame it and put it on my wall. It's that good. But there are so many other wonderful choices featuring characters that are doctors, which I love because I'm a pediatrician, scientists, and so much more. Buy your puzzle today. Check them out at puzzlehuddle.com. Is there a specific thing or specific suggestions that you have for parents, educators, caregivers, people who are watching and caring for youth activists? Do you have anything for them listening in? Um, how they can support youth activism, um, how they can make a space for youth activism. Things that I've been thinking about lately about how parents can support youth activists, specifically the youth, is financially. I think there's a lot going around about supporting uh, Black-owned business and organizations like the NAACP, Southern Poverty Law Center, uh, Equal Justice Initiative. And I think especially for kids in middle school and high school, you see those messages, you like them, you repost them, you support them. And then you're like, I'm 15. I don't have any money. So I did all I could do and I'm moving on. No, have a conversation with your parents. Like, how can we actually get involved? Like, what are some ways we can shift our spending? Or if parents are more involved in activism than their, their kids, parents should have the conversation with their kids. Like, this is important and we're going to get involved. Do you want to like be a part of the conversation while we decide like where we're going to donate or how we're going to be conscious of our, in our spending. Yeah, I would, I would just add, I think that um, it definitely depends on um, what kid you have. Are they introverted, extroverted? I think um, parents know their kids best and they know how to support their kids best. And I would say like lean on that instinct, but also give your kids space to articulate what they need from you. Um, for me, like I said earlier, like I needed my mom to pull me back from the ledge when I was doing a little bit too much and going a little bit too fast. Um, but I also needed that support from my mom when I decided to um, actually go out and protest in June um, to, you know, give me the resources to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm a phone call, a text away. Um, if you need to catch an Uber, like you can use my card, like stuff like that, um, where if your kids do decide to do something that's new or different, you know, and that may or may not be risky. You give them the space to do that, but you also equip them with the tools they need uh, to be successful when they do it. I would also say just to be patient, but also just being there for your child. For me, I'm the type of person to like just hold everything in. Like I will not say anything. I just keep it all in. And my mother has just been there for me, like just checking in on me, like, how are you doing? And just like, having those conversations with me so I don't have to constantly hold everything in, but I can release the pressure within myself. And 
then also referring to what Jack was saying, like, let your kids be part of the conversation. Like, don't exclude them from it because they're so young. Because y activism, there's not a certain age where it starts. Like, it starts, like, whenever. And, like, with our money, like, we advocate with our money, if we're being honest. I remember in July, like, we had that Blackout Tuesday. And so many people did not spend money um, at these businesses. But you know, relocated that money to black businesses and look at that. But if, if we constantly kept that um, in our daily, daily process and focused on supporting more black businesses, we could accomplish so much. I know in my routine, like before I buy anything, I look for a black business, make sure, <laughs> make sure that I'm going through that and like just adding black businesses to like my um, like common places where I shop. And I've been trying blackout business like um, black restaurants with my friends with my family just around the area in new jersey and finding new spots and that's been really fun that's a good bonding experience yeah yeah um speaking of black, supporting black businesses and financial support that's moving away from social media right that's that's a different type of activism if if you know what i'm saying what other ways can youth get involved if they're not that involved in social media, if they don't have that type of platform? Yeah, I would say there are so, so many different ways to get involved. It's almost impossible. Like, I feel like we'd have to do another three hour long podcast just listing the ways for young folks to get involved. Um, I'd say like the the easiest thing to do is get involved in your school like that. That is um, kind of like the the mock trial, the stage before you actually step out into the real world and really start pushing for things with stakeholders. Um, you know, for me personally, I um, I ran for class office and I used that to to sharpen my um, you know my my advocacy skills um, and being able to talk with adults in the room and, and get their ear and convince them to do things that are in the best interest of the students. Um, but I say if, if young folks are actually ready to get out there and start doing doing work in their communities find local organizations that you can volunteer with. Spending your time, even if you don't have the money, is something that's incredibly valuable. Um, and I think that's that's a great place to start. I feel like it's, I'm not gonna, I mean, easier isn't the right word, but it's just more common to see people outside the house protesting, holding up a sign. Okay, we appreciate you going, doing that, right? But. I wouldn't even say that's the hardest part. I think the hardest part is radicalizing your mind. And so with that, getting involved, go read a book. A lot of the theories and like just the language, the verbiage that activists are using today come from older generations, comes from James Baldwin, Audre Lorde. So pick up a book by them because they are the one with the language who will tell you everything. You can look at these Instagram posts, which is fine, go do that, but don't let it stop there. The last thing, I completely agree with what Caleb and Rakai have said, but I'd also add uh, the kind of eat your vegetables component of other ways to get involved, which is vote or get your parents to vote if you can't. It's the eat your vegetables option because it's an option whether you like the candidates or not. And personally, I feel that the past two election cycles, we haven't gotten like candidates that the country really wants to stand behind or at least uh with trump as the opposition we haven't gotten an op opponent to trump that the country really wants to stand behind um i th so i saw someone else post this if we're talking about social media that if your vote wasn't powerful they wouldn't be trying so hard to suppress it uh and so i think that's just worth keeping in mind that getting your parents your cousins your family out to change who's representing uh, you in state, local, national government has a big impact. Yeah, and I actually just, I feel like I'd be, sorry, I don't want to interrupt. Keep I just, no, keep I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't mention this because I literally just worked for an organization that spent all their time around getting people out to vote. Like, please find time to volunteer with those organizations that are calling people that are trying to get them registered to vote that are trying to get them um, to figure out how to get their vote by mail applications that stuff is so important because when you're able to build a voting coalition that consistently votes then the people who are running for office have to listen to you because you're the ones putting them in office and you're the ones holding them accountable 
So please, please, please volunteer with those organizations. If you're old enough to vote, vote. Bring your family out to vote. Make it a party. Make it a celebration. Like, just do it. And I'm, I'm just a little curious. Has voting, voting plans, voting registration, has that become a frequent conversation topic for you? In terms of, uh, like, sorry, and let me add on. In terms of, like, mail-in ballots, what's happening with the U.S. Postal Service, all that. Yeah, it's definitely been tough because there's a lot of stuff up in the air about um, what USPS is going to look like by November. Um, and I think that, you know, we just have to wait and see. Uh, but for the time being, like I've, I did, you know, phone banking sessions where I just called uh, an existing database of registered voters in Illinois, like just cold called them, asked them if they were planning on voting. And a lot of them um, didn't know how to request a vote by mail ballot. Um, and so those were a lot of the conversations that I was having, trying to tell people, hey, here's the website you can go to to get that ballot. Um, and trying to assure people that like, hey, this is, you know, probably your safest shot um, at voting, considering the pandemic that's going on. Um, but that definitely has been something that I've been going back and forth with recently, because, you know, we don't know if those mail-in ballots are actually going to get counted. And I think it, it remains to see, be seen what this election is going to look like. Um, but I hold out hope and I still encourage people to, to vote by mail if they can. And if they have to go in um, to vote, vote early if possible. Yeah, so it's definitely been a conversation here as well in Maryland. Maryland, we were fortunate enough to have the governor declare the primaries this spring as all vote by mail. So you didn't even have to request a ballot. We just got them in the mail. But the strain on uh, the Postal Service is throwing into question whether that same uh, path will even be an option uh, for the fall. And so that's that's a real concern. Uh, as far as the message that I'm trying to put out to literally anybody who will listen, it's request your voter ballot as soon as possible. So do it now. Uh, there was a great post that went viral about flattening the ballot request curve. It's very topical given COVID. Um, but yeah, I'm, I mean, I had to, I, I had to almost laugh, Caleb, when you said that to de-stress and detox, I read 1984, completely unrelated to the world we live in today. I'm like, oh my goodness, that's exactly the world we're living in today. They're carting off mailboxes. But yeah, it's, it's been, you know, a, a topic of conversation and of great concern. But I would encourage everyone to request as soon as you possibly can. It's definitely been a topic um, in my household, just talking about the USPS and what that's going to look like, um, and just voting in general. I just registered for vote, so when I turn 18, <laughs> I turn 18, I'm going to get my literal voter card, and I'm really excited for that. But I'll admit, like, there's a lot of information that I just don't know. But um, I like just in this meeting, like, I'm really, I've been encouraged, like, just to like find out what's voting like in Newark, New Jersey, what's voting like in New Jersey in general. So after this podcast, I'm going to do my research. Thank you so much for listening to What is Black. I want to thank our special guest, Nina Duje, for hosting this episode and her guests, Caleb Dunson, Rakaya Lucas Caldwell, and Jacob Starbin. They were, it was a wonderful conversation. I learned so much and I hope you did as well. I especially love the emphasis on tips for parents as well as their role in activism and tips for how young people can get involved in activism. And, as, and more importantly, I'm um, the discussion about voting and it's so important. So if you are registered to vote, I'm encouraging you to vote this year. November 3rd is one of the most important days um, in 2020. So if you can vote early, vote early in your states. Um, if you're if you're going to vote on November 3rd, let's go out in mass to vote because um, this is this is an important time for us. 2020, we can make a difference. So thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, I'd encourage you to check out um, my recent blog post about um, how parents can talk tips for parents to talk to their children about voting. And there's some great resources to find out how you can still register to vote and also encourage your children how to register to vote. To learn more about what is black, you can go to our website at www.whatisblack.co and you can follow us on social media at what is black at W-H-A-T-I-S-B-L-K on Instagram, Twitter, 
and Facebook. 